Okay, welcome. Thank you for staying on. We didn't lose too many people, uh, I think. Uh, this may go on a little longer because we've been delayed, but I want to talk about... Um, uh, it's not advancing because for some reason. Hello, ma'am. Um, yeah, we okay. have the second okay. slide. The second slide. So I want to talk about the second slide. Yeah. May I suggest to unmute slide. everyone? Yes. <laughs> okay, so I want to cover uh, uh, these issues um, building performance, global issues, trend codes, operational carbon, embodied carbon, life cycle assessment climate action plans, decarbonization, existing buildings, building disclosures, and takeaways, which will be the conclusion. Please, I hope you will... Excuse me? Can we all please uh, uh, mute ourselves? Thank you. Yeah, man. Um, um, Hope you all come away with a good understanding of carbon inch. Hello. Hello, sir. Please hand it up to Hindi. Please mute, please. There's too many background. Okay. So historically, uh, we used various metrics for building performance. Cost was always the most prominent one, but we're now looking at other not just first cost, but operational costs, return on investment, life cycle costs throughout the whole life of the building. Other metrics like spatial utilization, life of facility, reduced risk, user satisfaction, productivity is increasingly becoming a metric that building owners are using. And now we're seeing environmental metrics, energy, life cycle, global warming impacts, which is what we're gonna focus on. A green building, green rating systems, green codes, and green tariffs. And these are all new items that are being introduced into the building uh, community as far as metrics are concerned. So they're going way beyond code now. Um, and the major drivers for this have been the environmental uh, conferences and summits that have been that we've had over the last 36 years. Hello, sir. Is... Please speak Hindi. Hello, sir. Please speak Hindi. Actually, I can't. I don't. I'm, I didn't get your question. This is we're on background major drivers. That slide. I uh, hope you can all see that. And it started in 1987 when the United Nations, the Brundtland Commission report, basically said the United Nations should be involved. That the United Nations should be involved in environmental concerns. And from that, we've had a several other summits culminating in the most recent one in Dubai uh, in December, which was COP28. And so we've had numerous conferences and summits over these questions. And the focus today is on uh, climate change issues. And it, to prepare for the COP28 uh, conference in Dubai, the United Nations commissioned a, a report and is trying to close the window based on the Paris Climate Accords that were, were, were uh, that, was ratif that was ratified in 2015 by 195 countries. And it's trying to uh, reduce the, uh, keep the uh, atmospheric temperature below an increase of 1.5 degrees centigrade and if that's not possible, at least below a two degree centigrade increase by um, by 
2021. So uh, we're talking about uh, at the end of this century. And this agreement went into effect in 2000. It was ratified in 2015 and went into effect at 2000. The COP28 conference was, was to see how well the world is doing as far as meeting these requirements are concerned. This is our latest uh, measurement of atmospheric CO2 measured in Hawaii. Uh, and it's the cleanest air in the world there. So they measure this sort of, and they don't have much industry. So it tends to be a very good indicator. And we're seeing we're now at 420 parts per million. And we don't see much of a decrease. And that, that slope going up does not seem to be decreasing, even though we've been in, involved in mitigating CO2 issues in the atmosphere now for a number of years. So these are some of the um, projections that have emerged from the uh, COP28 conference. This was prepared by the Climate Action Tracker. And they're basically saying it doesn't look very good that we're gonna meet the projections uh, globally, that, we, that the Paris Accord um, agreed to. And uh, it's, it's very disturbing. And so the issue now is, can we increase our diligence and our various mitigating issues that we have to face? The building sector, if we look at the seven sectors that the UN IPCC report uh, or, or, or panel have been doing work on, the building sector of the, of the seven sectors that they looked at have the potential for the most mitigation of CO2 in the atmosphere of approximately, possibly 66 gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year. And that's that circled, uh, um, that oval, the orange oval there, focusing on building sector, showing you that at various costs, at $20 a ton, $50 a ton, $100 a ton, it's showing that we potentially can mitigate uh, six gigatons out of the atmosphere. It's no other sector of the global economy can we get that much mitigation at, out of the atmosphere as far as CO2 potential is concerned. Common de definitions of CO, uh, of, uh, we have several definitions of net zero energy buildings, which is basically a building that is just energy balanced. Then we can have net zero carbon buildings, and that's that's a building that is carbon balanced. And we also can look at life cycle issues associated with carbon. That would be total uh, carbon in a building over its lifespan, and usually that's considered to be sixty years. And we have various reports that have been generated, particularly by the Department of Energy in the United States, that suggest these various definitions. We also have the business community that's come up with some definitions and they call it scope one, two, and three. And each scope relates to a different component of the industry. And in the building industry, we have basically a scope one is direct CO2 emissions on site. So this is from the building facility itself. And uh, then we have indirect carbon emissions that's associated with the operations of the building, the electricity, the steam, the, the chilled water that it's need that's imported from a utility to the building. And then in third, we actually look at indirect carbon emissions and that can be upstream or downstream emissions associated with what the building or the entity that's housed in the building produces. Is it an industrial building and it produces various products? And we have to look at the, the carbon embedded in those products, as well as how they are dealt with as far as its life cycle and the whole carbon process in its life cycle. So that's the scope one, two, and three that we see emerge is one way of accounting for carbon in our economy. And if we look at, at least this is US 
carbon, uh, this is US uh, carbon dioxide emissions. The United States is emitting about 5,000 million tons of CO2 uh, per year. And it look, then you have the various other sectors, the transportation, the industrial, the residential, the commercial. And then at year 2022, I have a line that goes straight down to 2050, which would be one of the carbon goals that, that we have emerged at zero carbon at 2050, about 640 to 60% reduction of carbon by 2030. Those are the two sort of numbers that we have, even though the the Paris Accord is talking about zero carbon by 2100, 2100. Uh, so that's our predicament. It doesn't look like the United States is going to meet these potential goals uh, um, because it's it's a tough a tough goal goal to uh, achieve. And uh, but the building sector may meet that those goals, and we'll talk about that. In particularly, the new buildings can meet the, these goals. We'll talk about that in a minute. Existing buildings it may be a difficulty. This is in the United States. Globally, it's a completely different story. And I don't have the numbers that I can really compare some of this work globally on, but I can compare it at least in the U.S. because that's what I'm familiar with and how we are addressing carbon issues in US built in the US building sector, both in new and existing buildings. Okay, building codes, we tend to have two options. We have the prescriptive option, which is very simple. Meet these numbers as far as your various components of a building is concerned, walls, windows, roofs, etc. Me having some thermal performance. Or we can have a, another approach, which is a performance approach, which basically looks at the entire building and not looks at, doesn't look at the component of the building. So here's would be a typical example of a U.S. building code uh, for uh, walls, roofs, windows. And this would be a prescriptive code. So you have to meet these values. They're measured in R or U values. That's just the way we define thermal performance of an assembly, a wall assembly, roof assembly, window assembly. This is generally the type of energy codes that we have in the United States, and I would say most of even Western Europe and parts of Asia. Um, however, there's a, been a push for a number of years to go to a performance-based code. So not looking at specific assemblies, but look at the entire building holistically. And this was attempted in the United States back in the 1980s with something called Building Energy Performance Standard called BEPS. So what we have is different locations along the left-hand side and along the top horizontal bar. We have different building types and we have the numbers are the what we call this is in source energy, but it's the amount of energy that's allowed to be used by the building per year. And those that was proposed back in the 1980s in the United States. And the problem is that we needed a computer simulation program to actually do the analysis. And back at that time, there were very, very little, very few programs available. And most, many of those programs ran on mainframes and were not user friendly. And that basically created a problem for performance standards. And in, for a number of years, they were abandoned in the United States. Today, we have very simple, very simple to use and very robust building simulation, energy simulation programs, so we can use them very effectively today. So performance standards are coming back into play, and I'll show you how that's op operating now in a few places in a few minutes. ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, have developed an energy code back in 1974. Uh, 1974 to 75 is called ASHRAE 9075. ASHRAE 90.1, 1975 was the first standard. 
And we've gone through a number of standards over the years to where we have today, 19, ASHRAE 90.1, 2009. ASHRAE is now becoming an international organization. I believe there is a Egyptian ASHRAE chapter, actually. And we are now, gen, ASHRAE is now generating the codes for different languages and for different climates and locations. So in fact, it's trying to be an international organization. It's like SIPSI in the in in the UK, which is the Charter Institute for Building Building Studies, Science, something like that. I think and that's a similar organization in the UK, uh, and they're working. All these organizations are working internationally, trying to come up with some standards. And so you can see here we go from 1975 at 100, which is the reference case, and down to where we are today with the standard, the most recent standard is the 2019 standard, which is about 45. So we've about halved it. But again, the reference we're taking for all the uh, protocols that we're seeing emerge is basically 2015. That's what Paris uh, Accord uses. And I think most people use that as well. To say if we uh, can we meet the net zero by 2030 in new buildings, possibly. Uh, if we use rooftop photovoltaic, we can see in 2030 that if we go at the same trajectory, possibly by that we had during from between 2004 and 2019, we'll probably be very close to that. And so for new buildings, I think it's achievable to be net zero energy, and I think also net zero carbon. Though carbon is a little harder to calculate because you're not just dealing with operational issues, you're also dealing with embodied carbon in a building. So for building operations, it's a much easier calculation because you just deal with what the electric gas, refrigerant, if we have that, uh, chilled water, water and waste, those are things we can quantify fairly easily and convert that into energy or into carbon. Embodied is also an important factor, and that will be increasingly important as we reduce the operational carbon and operational energy of a building. Uh, embodied carbon will become a bigger factor. And that's the carbon that's embedded in the building's structure and its materials, mechanical system, et cetera. And then we also have transportation issues associated with people commuting to the building and things like that. So those are the things that we want to look at from we look at from an operational to an embedded to a holistic ca calculation as far as emission, carbon emissions is concerned. We deal with the operational, it's fairly easy to calculate, embodied is much more difficult. And the reason for that is we don't have a lot of data on some of the building materials that we use as far as the energy content or even the carbon content. That's coming and many building manufacturers are beginning to make that information available. And we're beginning to see that now. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, uh, embodied carbon in a typical building enclosures might be 20 to 30%. Structure might be 45, 60%. Interior finishes and material carpeting and, and furniture and things like that might be 20 to 30%. So you can see body carbon can be a major issue, especially, as I said, as we reduce the footprint of the operational components of the building. And potential... Uh, opportunities for reducing carbon in with various materials in the building. We can have been mass timber. We're beginning to see mass timber used a lot in the United States, particularly in the uh, U.S. and Canada, uh, particularly. Uh, uh, concrete optimization. We can add very some additives to cement and reduce the amount of cement content and the high carbon con uh, content of manufacturing cement. And we can reduce our the um, carbon in cement. We can reduce it in steel as well by using more recycled steel. 
um, interior finishes, insulation materials, facade materials. So all these add up and we can begin to reduce our embodied carbon in the building. And here's some references that we have developed in the US, some, some publications that were sponsored by the Department of Energy to look at uh, these issues of embodied carbon in buildings. And those are available from that website if you'd like to get those publications. So the way we are at, I use it, the way we'll calculate embodied carbon is use tools like life cycle assessment or LCA. And that measures the environmental impacts at all life cycle during all life cycle phases. And carbon or global warming issues that carbon impacts will, is the prime impact that we'll be looking at within the LCA analysis. The LCA analysis looks at water and air pollution, lots of other things, but one of the components is uh, climate, um, um, global warming, and that would be the carbon um, category. It's not unlike food labels. I'm sure you have, uh, you may not have the same as what we have in the United States with food labels, but if you ever buy a international food product that's from Europe or the United States, you may see these nutrition labels on the can of soup or box of cereal, something like that. It's very similar to what we're trying to do now with LCA and what we are calling now environmental product declaration. Yes, yeah. they're, very, they're very similar to food labels. And we're now requiring manufacturers to develop these types of labels for all their products. So when you get a specification uh, Jesse Ram. What is how? I don't know. Okay. So these are, this is something we're beginning to see now in material. Jesse Ram. Uh, yes. again, I, yes. please, please mute. I'm hearing a lot of background. Now I'm here's, okay, here's a typical specification sheet that you would get from a ceiling. This is a yes. ceiling panel manufacturer. Is, is people sir, not hearing me? Is that the problem? Sir, what are What's you saying? Problem? I'm not understand. Please speak in Hindi. Hindi is possible. Habibi, he cannot have to speak in Hindi. You, if you don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, please, please mute if, if, please mute. Okay, this is a typical material specification sheet we are begin to see in the United States uh, because we're requiring information about the environmental impact of these various materials. As you see here, the one that we are most interested in is the global warming potential, and that's in kilograms of CO2 equivalent. And that number is something that we would use to compare different types of ceiling systems. So then we may be looking at a six or seven different ceiling systems. We look at the EP, EPD sheet. And if we're concerned about embodied carbon in a building and we wanna reduce that, we would specify the ceiling material that has the lowest global warming potential. 
And again, we can do an assembly um, LCA or whole building LCA or whole project LCA. And the env environmental product declarations feed that LCA analysis. So here's what typically you might see. Here you have, uh, I think, eight uh, carpeting, uh, different carpets, carpet materials. We have a baseline that is telling us the average for carpeting is, for typical carpeting, would be 13 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per square foot. And here we have eight different brands of carbon going from 9.5 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per square foot down to 1.9. So here you have a choice now in specifying your carpeting material for your building. And if you're really trying to, to reduce embodied carbon, you would pick the lowest one. Okay. And then what we do is assemble all this material into a um, an LCA uh, program, which is like a cost uh, cost analysis program or a quantity quantity surveying type of program, where we get the cost of the building by in including all the materials and the relative cost from some sort of um, database, and we would calculate the cost of the building. We do the same thing here. We bring that data in from the EPD, Environmental Product Declaration, the global warming impact of that material. And again, kilograms of CO2 equivalent per unit. And we add that up for all our materials in the building and we get our environmental um, in, embodied carbon number. A program that, that I use a lot is called uh, Athena um, Eco Calculator. It was developed in Canada, but it's used widely in the United States and in Canada. There are a number of other programs in Europe and several other parts of the world that will do this, do LCA analysis and, and have a similar type of format as this program. This program is free and can be downloaded from the site. I'll show you in a second. But what you have is like a materials calculator. You have your assemblies here, and then you you have your for your different assemblies for your building. Uh, you have your, your your energy. You have your global warming. You have acidification. You have health impacts, ozone depletion, and smog impact. The item we're looking at is the is would would be the global warming potential. It would be this column here. So we we assemble the materials that are in our building. The square we put in the the, the square feet or square meters of the material. And here we we have an example of foundations. We have nineteen thousand eight hundred square. Feed in this case, we're still in feed in the United States. We, we haven't <laughs> changed that. Uh, and then we see the the impact in megajoules for energy, um, CO2 in tons of CO2 equivalent, then acid uh, health impacts, et cetera. And then we do that for the entire building, all the assemblies in the building, and we get the total building value. In this case, we have 863 tons of CO2 equivalent. And then what we would do is do an, a building with alternatives. So re, one building we may be using steel and do the analysis using steel as the major assembly for let's say structure. And then we use another one with concrete. Then we might use another one rather than concrete frame and infill block or something like that. So we can now look at several alternatives. And from that analysis, we can pick the one that has the lowest embodied carbon. So that's how we use the EPD data that we get from the manufacturers, which should be done by a third party because the manufacturers 
may not be totally transparent. So a third party is usually somebody who's been certified in the United States. We're certifying third party consultants that will do this type of analysis for manufacturers, for their materials, and they can then publish that in their specifications. And then we take that, put it into an LCA and do the analysis that you see here. Here's an example of looking at, uh, we're looking at concrete, steel, and timber. And here we do, so we're doing three comparative analysis using that LCA approach that I just showed you and showing that we can optimize and reduce the, if we go with a concrete building, we're gonna reduce it down to, to by 32% from the base case or 27% for the base case of steel or 29 or 69% for the base case for timber. Um, so that's how we would use this tool because it's not a precise science yet because we still don't have a lot of data in for a lot of building materials because they haven't gone through the L L EPD process and the manufacturer hasn't done that. And uh, so we don't have it for a lot of building materials. So we that's why we do comparisons. So the errors or the deficiencies that are in the process are possibly balanced in all the, looking at all the various major infrastructure like concrete, steel, wood, things like that. We're beginning to see a number of net zero buildings being achieved. This is a New Building Institute uh, survey a couple of years or a couple of years ago. Uh, and they have tracking and they are verifying buildings that are actually net zero. These are, these are net zero energy. We're also layering net zero carbon uh, certification as well. So we're beginning to see certification of buildings today in the United States done by, again, third parties. And that potential, this is a marketing study done recently uh, showing a tremendous potential for uh, net zero energy and net zero carbon buildings in the marketplace. And the industry is responding appropriately. We're seeing publications like this, high performance buildings, and another one, net zero buildings. And they are now doing case studies on buildings that have been certified by in the in institutions like the New Building Institute and are very attractive, very contemporary buildings that are getting a lot of attention. Here's a, a building that I'm familiar with that uh, you can get from this magazine called High Performance Building Magazine, and that is subscription is free from ASHRAE. And this is a building that I've been involved in. It's a very nice building. And it's not only net zero, it's actually net positive energy uh, because it actually has a lot of photovoltaic, photovoltaic systems on the roof that's actually generating more energy than the building is consuming. They haven't gone through a carbon analysis, but they're planning to. And I, I hope to help them do the carbon uh, analysis. Uh, as well as the energy analysis for the them, but they have been certified as a net uh, net positive energy building, so they're on a good track to be a net positive, po potentially a net zero carbon building. And here's some again some case studies that are on the high performance uh, building website, and these are buildings that are documented to be net zero energy or net zero carbon buildings. So it's a good resource. Um, ASU, my university, has attempted to do a net zero energy building. And it's been partially successful. Uh, it's actually in some way been so successful that students love it so much and they use it so much that the energy profile is much greater than what we simulated at the beginning of the building project because the building is being used almost 24 seven in some cases. Um, it has an ample amount of photovoltaic, and it's just a very handsome building. And we document that, and we actually put it on our campus website, and you can see the performance in real time. And we also have done a carbon action plan. 
um, issues, one of the first, and here was our trend uh, if we stayed on our path and by introducing various new business practices and commuter practices, uh, we're introducing um, sort of sharing systems, uh, uh, reducing our energy demand as well, and our utilities also cleaning up their mix of generating capacity to actually look at more renewable technologies and thus reducing their carbon footprint. So as a utility reduces their carbon footprint, the, the people who are being serviced by utility are improving their carbon footprint because the energy they're buying, this indirect energy that they're buying from the utility is actually uh, cleaner than it was a few years ago. So the utilities have a lot to do with this whole issue as well. And these carbon action plans are being used by industry now. I would say most of the, what we call the Fortune 500 industries in the United States have agreed to have carbon uh, or climate action plans. And we see that now. And in fact, this is something that a lot of con business consultants are working on today because it's a requirement now, near, near requirement. The Security and Exchange Commission, who regulates a lot of large corporations that are traded on the stock exchange, are requiring this. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Okay. Our utilities are decarbonizing, decarbonizing, going through decarbonization very rapidly now. Number of utilities have committed to uh, here's 170 cities and eight states in the United States that have committed to 100% decarbonization by 2050 or sooner. And those are the eight states on the side here that have committed to that. And more and more are signing up all the time. And we're, we're beginning to see tremendous uh, um, commitments made, being made by utilities in the United States. Here's, here's the utilities in my state. We have three of them, APS, TP, TEP, and SRP. Um, each one of them have made a major uh, commitment to reduce carbon emissions. APS, which is one of our largest utility in the state, is, is, is basically shutting down all coal-fired generating plants by 2031. And they will then be 100% zero carbon emissions. So... They're not necessarily going to, they, so they, all the renewables and nuclear is considered in this case to be zero carbon emissions. So they're doing it for us in a way. If you're an all electric building and you're in the APS service territory, you are already carbon neutral. If, um, and the same is happening with the other two utilities in the state. And this is voluntary. They're not being required by law to do this. They're doing this on their own because the market is pushing them to this. 100% clean energy. They, they call it clean energy. They don't necessarily call it carbon neutral or carbon because nuclear is part of that mix. And envi some environmentalists don't consider nuclear to be be as clean as it as some others. So there, there's a big di discussion about that today. Okay, so existing buildings, I think, is doable. 50% uh, by 2030 and 100% net zero by 2050. I think that is very doable for new buildings. Existing buildings, it's another story. And many people who've been tracking the, the profiles on existing buildings are telling us we're not going to meet our carbon goals nationally uh, unless we become much more aggressive in focusing on existing buildings. One of the techniques we're using to focus on existing buildings is using building energy disclosure processes. And we have a number of cities and states in the United States that have what we call energy disclosure policies in place. And this is now requiring buildings to document their performance. And one way we do that in, in the US is through uh, disclosure tools like the 
Environmental Protection Agency Portfolio Manager. It's just a very simple spreadsheet tool that allows you to input your building and it gives you your um, energy profile of the building in comparison to all the existing buildings in that class in your location. So you now can compare buildings with the, your peer buildings in your city or your location. A very simple program, you put in your building, you put where it is, you put in a zip code, which is a, co a postal code that brings up weather information as far as where your climate is. And when you input your building, you input your the building type, as well as the number of people, occupants, square feet, et cetera. And it actually looks into a database and finds out how well your building's performing in relationship to your peer database that it, it has for your location. So here's just a screen showing you a building built in 2004, 50,000 square foot, 100% occupancy office building. You put it in and you get your scoring. And here you just have one building. So you, you're doing it for your the first year and you get a score of 70, in this case, 76%. So you're in the 76 percentile. Uh, and that, and then if you do it again for year two, year three, year four, you're supposed to do this every year and see how track how well your building is performing over time. And then you'll get a baseline score, and then you'll get a current score for the each year you're doing the analysis for. And it's on a score from one to a hundred. You can also see it in source energy in BTUs per square foot, site energy, energy cost, and total carbon emissions. And that's in tons of uh, tons of CO2 equivalent. So it's a very useful tool. And it can track on a monthly basis. You can also bring in your utility data into the program and it can do it automatically. And it can deal with water and waste as well but energy is the one that we are most interested in. Energy is where the carbon is also embedded. And here's another example of a, the metrics that come out. And as I said, you're supposed to be doing this every year. Here's top cities that have incorporated this. And you can see a number of cities have quite, quite a lot of buildings that are being scored in this process using the EPA portfolio management. As I said, that tool is available. I'm just trying to see if I can find the, there it is. There's a portfolio manager is available free on the internet. Uh, the problem is it can only be used really in the United States because that's where the database is based on. Um, but I could see tools like this being developed in other parts of the world. Not that hard to do. Okay, what New York City has done is develop a law uh, to disclose the energy being used by all the buildings over a certain amount of square feet in the city of New York, particularly in this case, uh, commercial buildings and multifamily housing called Local Law 84. It's been in place for about 10 years now, and it uses the Energy Star Portfolio Manager as its submittal tool. So you have to do this every year and submit your building to the city of New York for certification. Right now, it's just, it's just for certification purposes. There's no penalties associated with the building's performance, but that is changing, and I'll show you that in a second. So here's some of the uh, various cities that have disclosure laws like New York City, but New York City is the biggest one because it was the first one and the one that has probably the most aggressive policies in place now for measuring um, uh, carbon performance in buildings. This shows you just the mix of various building types, showing you the number of properties and their relative 
energy use of those properties. And here's it over time when the building was built and it's showing you both commercial and office scoring. And the interesting thing is some of the buildings built back in the 1920s and 30s actually perform better than buildings built today, which is kind of funny, interesting, I think. And the mean score for the buildings that have been inputted into the New York City local law 84 has been 70. The, the median, median score for the nation is 50. So actually the buildings in New York are doing a little better than the national average. And the nice thing about this is you're now doing it for a number of years. So here we have three years of data in office, as far as office buildings are concerned. And we see a, 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 a trend downward, which is good. That's exactly what we wanna do. By having this level of transparency and everybody knowing what other buildings are using, you get actually get people and, and building owners now competing with themselves to have actually a better performing building because this is now in the public record. And here's just a, a slight portion is over probably well over 5,000 buildings in the database in New York City now. And here you have is the site energy scoring. And then here's the EPA energy star scoring. So you can see here, not, you know, a couple of buildings are performing fairly well, 86 percentile. That's right, pretty good. But some of them are not, 27. And again, the average for the city is 70. And what the city is now going to do is use that as a metric that energy star score as a metric for finding people or putting up or allow, developing a what I call a green tariff for carbon on these buildings. And you use this process that has been established by local law 87 as the as data for the tariff. And they have a very nice uh, um, map on their webpage, showing you all the buildings in New York City that have now been um, been documented. So right now, at this time, this is a little bit old, but it has 8,731 buildings and showing you how many are offices, how many multi multifamily housing, how many are hospitals, et cetera. And then you can blow up and, and actually come in on the site and actually see where those buildings are and look them up. Hey, what New York City recently did is use the Local Law 84 as the basis for developing Local Law 897, which actually now is putting a, which is a green tariff on buildings that are using certain levels of carbon above the threshold that they have established within, the, within this legislation. So what they've done is um, are charging building owners uh, $268 for every metric ton of CO2 equivalent over the threshold. And that threshold will change as we go from now to 2050. Uh, and I'll show you that threshold in a second. And if you fail in to file a compliance report, you're, you're fined 50 cents per square foot per month. So that can add up very quickly. It could be a lot of money. A uh, $100,000 bill, uh, 100,000 square foot building, that would be $50,000 a month. And that would be almost $600,000 a year in fines if it did not submit its compliance report. And then if you have false statement in your compliance report, you're fined $500,000. So these are pretty hefty uh, fines, as well as the $268 per ton sort of tax that you're going to be paying for carbon above the threshold that you use in your building. So you can see that New York City is getting very, very... Uh, um, focused on this. And the reason for that is they saw that they were not going to meet their um, 
They did the analysis for what New York City should be meeting as far as the Paris Accord is concerned, as far as the United States commitment to the Paris Accord is concerned, and found out it was not going to meet its obligation. So that's one of the reasons why the city of New York is being a lot more, I guess, uh, reg uh, reg aggressive at looking at the financial implications of this. So here's a, a number, here's an example from Local Law 97, showing all the building activities, courthouse, data center, library, schools, office buildings, et cetera. And it's giving you your building emissions intensity limit measured in tons of CO2 equivalent per square foot. So you, uh, based on your building type, you multiply that by your square feet and you get your threshold. You put that information into your, into the spreadsheet window that they developed for local law 97, put that data in or bring that data in from your utility information or from the um, Energy Star uh, program. Uh, portfolio manager program that can be fed automatically into this. It populates the screen and tells you how your building is doing and the, the various, if it's meeting, uh, if it's below the threshold for that period, and if it's above the threshold, what your fine or penalty or tax that you have to pay. So here's an example of that. Here's a building that is using, uh, it's emitting, in 2024 to 2029, so it's a five-year period, it's emitting 1,806 metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year. The threshold is 2,518. It has no penalty because this period, the threshold is above, uh, the building is below the threshold. In the second five-year period, from 2030 to 2034, your emission is, in this case, they made a slight improvement in the building's carbon emissions down to 1,629. And the threshold was 1,142. So you're actually above the threshold. So you now pay a fine and you're paying a fine of $130,000 $633,000 in, in fine for every year that you're not meeting, uh, that you're above the threshold. The next period, 2035 to 2039, uh, the building's using the same amount of emissions. The threshold went down because it's trying to, again, get buildings to get down to the net the zero mark. And your penalty now is uh, $204,000. The next period is a 10-year period, 2040 to 2049. Uh, there, the threshold went down to 594. Your penalty per year is now $277,000. And finally, you, didn't, you have no improvement in the building. It's still using the same amount it's using back in 2030. Uh, the threshold is zero. So you should have been carbon, you know, net zero carbon, and you're not. And your penalty is $436,000. So you can see it adds up quite quickly. And for a building owner, these numbers and fines or penalties would be enough for them to, I think, be more proactive and start introducing various interventions into the building to reduce their carbon emissions. Uh, California is also developing a disclosure requirement with financial implications. And the SEC, which is the Security and Exchange Commission, that's the federal agency that regulates all business security data uh, at, that of companies that are of that are 
exchange that are on the uh, stock exchange. And so here's the various requirements for the California and the SEC disclosure. And again, very similar to what we just talked about. Here they're using the scope one, two, and three as their references, not necessarily the technique that we showed you in local law 97, which is using the Energy Star portfolio manager tool. Here they're just using the, the as I said, the more traditional business tool of the scopes. And there's also uh, implications as far as fines associated with not meeting performance over time. So takeaways as far as uh, what we've talked about today, uh, carbon's concern, it's a global imperative that every country and economic sector needs to address, has to address. There's no getting around that. Building codes are, are, need to be more performance-based. We talked about that. As we reduce operational issues and uh, embodied carbon concerns become more critical and become more part of the pie or the total picture. Uh, right now, they're relatively small. Embodied carbon is about maybe 10% of a typical building's carbon profile today, but that can change as we reduce the operational carbon issues. Um, LCA and EPDs uh, are critical in developing net zero analyses that we've talked about. The building sector may have an easier time at addressing net zero issues than other sectors, especially in new buildings, which I think they can meet the, some of the goals that we've established for buildings. Existing buildings are much more of a challenge than new buildings, that's given. Climate action plans are important to achieving net zero futures. And disclosure policies along the lines of local law 84 and local law 97 that we see in New York are provide, I think, very good tools. And in the case of New York, tariffs to achieve net zero building, especially in existing buildings. Okay, I uh, like to thank you all for for staying by and uh, continuing the present, uh, continuing to listen to the presentation. Uh, if we have any time, I'm available. If you want to have some questions, we can on mic or raise your hand, and uh, we can on mic your uh, unmute you, and I can try to answer as many questions as possible. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harvey. Uh, it was really interesting how far you have advanced in the US with the, your efforts for net zero uh, energy and carbon uh, buildings. And uh, I hope that we can start uh, these efforts here in Egypt uh, someday. Uh, we have a few uh, questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Nabil Sabri, uh, can you please uh, yeah, unmute yourself and uh, uh, yes. ask your question? Yes. Uh, first of all, I uh, join uh, Dr. Tamer about the, uh, the the fact that this presentation has been informing and many new uh, concepts have been introduced that I didn't know about before. And I think they are very important in our uh, target to meet the, uh, the, uh, the net zero carbon. Yes, uh, I'm just a little bit, uh, <clears throat> let's say, intrigued by uh, some uh, data that you have given about, for example, the EPD uh, of different types of carpets, and the, and and the numbers were very very different. But uh, what do we factor in it? Is it just the the carbon emission, or Maybe uh, uh, this has an, uh, an effect on the insulation, perhaps, and hence on energy in an, in an indirect way. And then there is another factor, which is, I don't know how can we factor it, which is the, uh, the fire hazards, for instance. Uh, can you uh, uh, tell us more about this? How can we combine yeah. all these effects together? Well, again, some of those other metrics that we associate with building materials are still at play. Obviously cost. I mean, we're not going to 
go to the lowest carbon embedded product if it costs 10 times more than a the the average material uh that's just not going to happen so we again the issues of fire we have code requirements for fire requirements and things like that uh those are also going to be in play we're not going to throw away you know you know 50 years of uh, fire studies that have been that have been developed to improve material properties uh because of introducing carbon concerns obviously we're going to still use those as as a, a component as well in selecting materials i'm just trying to show you how you would go that process as i said there was i think six or seven categories within the lca uh, car, uh global warming potential was just one of them there was air pollution water pollution various other criteria from lca and then all the other things that that we used to deal with building materials um, like fire issues, acoustical performance, uh, durability. Those are still going to be in, being used by specifiers and engineers and architects in the design of a building. We're not going to eliminate those. It's just introducing a new mix into the selection process. Um, and we have to balance that, obviously, with cost. And in the case of New York City, penalties that you may have in the future if you don't meet these obligations. Thank you for your question. Very good question. Thank you. Uh, we have Dr. Luai. Uh, Dr. Luai? Uh, Dr. Yes. yes. OK, Professor Tamer. Uh, excellent presentation, Professor Harvey. Yes, uh, I'm learning more about that. Uh, I have a question about um, um, the hospitals for Aswan University, especially uh, the ambient temperature at the winter, 25 degree centigrade. At, at, uh, um, at summer, it is uh, around figure 45 degrees centigrade. We used already the ASHRAE year uh, 2020 for the central of air conditions. Uh, by a uh, method of inverter. Can you advise me in the, um, uh, another methods uh, to can use it to reduce the carbon emission? Yeah, uh, again, ASHRAE is struggling with a lot of these issues, especially as they expand to be a, more of an international organization. And um, I know the same thing is happening with lead, the lead system. A lot of countries have tried to use the lead system. I know um, a number of my students are Indian students, and they've tried to use lead system in India. And they found out that it actually pushes you towards certain kind of Western concepts that may not be always that appropriate for, for the, you know, the host country. Um, it may push you towards central air conditioner conditioning and may push you towards all air uh, systems, things like that, which may not be appropriate. So in fact, uh, I got a number of comments back from my students saying that, you know, ASHRAE and LEED and all various other Western, you know, tools and organizations, uh, tools that, that are looking at um, uh, environmental issues associated with buildings are not all that uh, ex you know, uh, exportable directly. You have to make modifications to it based yes. on the local conditions. And I think that's what's happening. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I know I did talk to a, a colleague, Egyptian colleague of mine here in the United States uh, who yeah. has done a lot of work in Egypt. And he says that uh, one of the things that the, I think the Egyptian ASHRAE chapter is doing is trying to localize a lot of the ASHRAE documents for Egypt. And I think that's that will be very helpful, and that may solve a lot of these issues that I think you're 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 you are now um, uh, experiencing. Yes, I'd like to make uh, many cooperations with you when you visit Aswan University next year. Thank you. Yes, yes, I, I am planning to uh, visit Egypt possibly uh, in April at the end of uh, Ramadan. Uh, for ah, yes. Weekend. 
exactly uh, for a week or two. I know. I, I I've been to the Middle East during Ramadan, and everybody's very grumpy because they haven't eaten. <laughs> drank, <laughs> so I, I, I wait till after Ramadan to go. go okay, to the Middle East. that's much. Okay, this. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And again, if you here's my email address. So if you have any ideas about because I'm thinking about what I need to present at because I want to make a present presentation at each of our host universities in Egypt. Um, and I really want to want to do that and uh, interact with the faculty and students at each university. And, uh, and so I really would like to get some input from you as how you might want to see what what you would like to see me do and i could customize my presentation a little bit more for your specific needs so please um, uh, communicate with me i could follow up on some of this what we just outlined here and get into more detail we can spend a whole day in a workshop and actually go through a building as a case study or something like that um so it's it's really we're, we're it's really open to uh, some of the input that you may have as far as what you'd like to see from me in April when I visit Egypt. Okay, Professor, I will contact with you with, through email. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, we're looking forward to your uh, trip, doc, uh, Dr. Harvey, and uh, yeah, we will be in contact with you uh, uh, soon organizing uh, this, uh, 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 this visit. Uh, we have uh, one uh, final uh, question from uh, Shubham Kumar. Okay. I don't hear anyone. Yeah, on mute. It seems he, he yeah, something uh, wrong. Yeah, he lowered his hand. Okay. Uh, no problem. I think let me check the uh, Q&A. Uh, okay. Uh, Shubham Kumar, do you have a question? Do you want to ask a question? You are muted. We cannot hear you. Okay, maybe he has some uh, uh, issues uh, with connectivity or something. So, uh, yeah. No, sir. No, any question. Yes. Do you have a question? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Shubham, where are you from? I am I am from Bihar. From where? From Bihar. Nawada. Nawada College, Government Protecting Nawada. Okay, okay. Welcome, welcome to our seminar. Okay, sir, thank you. Uh, Okay, Dr. Harvey, thank you very much for this uh, informative session and uh, looking forward to meeting you in Cairo uh, soon, uh, inshallah. Yes, thank you. Thank everybody for staying on and uh, please uh, communicate with me if you have any other questions or you have something you'd like me to, to focus on when I do visit Egypt in uh, April.